While it was Toronto Police Constable James Forsillo who was found guilty this week in the shooting death of Sammy Yatim, for many, how police are trained and what risks they're asked to take in the line of duty was also on trial. Joining us now for their verdicts, Jennifer Schulenberg. She is Professor of Sociology and Legal Studies at the University of Waterloo. John Burnside, Toronto City Councillor and a former police officer. And David Mercury is here, also a former Metro Toronto police officer and now an intra-family dispute mediator. And it's good to have, David, you back for uh, what you. is an uh, encore presentation. You've been here many times. And to uh, our two rookies here, thank you for coming in as well. Uh, David, you first. Reaction to the Forsillo verdict. Uh, my reaction was surprise uh, just by, because of the verdict on the charge. Okay. Um, and also, it's kind of a wait and see, because he's been found guilty, but it's wait and see as far as what the sentence will be. Meaning, do you think he's going to go to jail? Yeah, I don't, I don't have faith that he'll go to jail. Um, although I, I, I think he should go to jail. Um, I think he's fortunate to have gotten off with the sentence that he did, as opposed to a second degree murder. Gotcha. Jennifer, your view on the verdict. My view on the verdict is more of a broader approach in the sense that it raises a lot of issues that we need to now consider. So, for instance, the ways in which we respond to persons with a mental illness, the training issues, and to consider the fact that there are millions of calls for service and approximately 25% involve persons with a mental illness, and we only have a few cases that have come forward with lethal, lethal force. Say that again. 25% of the cases that yes. come forward involve mental illness? I involve a, a person who has an identified mental illness. That's what I've found in my research thus far across several services. And what would alcohol or drugs, if you added that into the mix, what would it bring it to? Approximately 30% of the calls for service involve a person under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Hmm. So it adds a new dimension that we do need to consider in the sense of what's happening with this verdict and what's led to it. We will pick up on that. John, your view on the verdict. Well, I think you've got a lot of people on one side that are unhappy, mostly in the police community, and then on the other side, the critics of the police are unhappy, and I think everyone in the middle is, says it's a pretty, think it's a pretty reasonable decision. We sometimes say that in journalism, is that if you have people over here yelling at you and people over here yelling at you, you probably got it right. You got it right. So yeah. you think the verdict then is just? Well, I think that it's going to be perceived as that. Uh, I wasn't at the trial every day, right. so, and it, I don't want to be too much of an armchair uh, critic or quarterback on the actual trial itself, but just judging from people that have seen the, and I have seen, of course, the, the video and people who have followed it, I think they probably got it right. Gotcha. Jennifer, the, the case for appeal, I gather, which Forsillo's lawyers are advancing, is that he was just following his training as a police officer when he shot Sammy a team. That's going to be the argument. Do you think, based on your knowledge of how police are trained, that he was just following his training? My answer to that is yes and no. You need to think about this incident, this 50 seconds as two chunks. The first three shots that were fired and then the resulting six shots that were fired. And under circumstances of extreme stress and crisis, you, you rely on your training. So it's not something where an officer sits there and says, this is no big deal, I'm going to discharge my firearm. So is there an issue with training? I think to some extent it is something to consider in terms of the use of force model and how an officer perceives a situation. Hmm. And that's going to depend on an officer. It's, it's different for every person, just like for you and I. Hmm. David, if it's, is it possible? that one of the reasons that Forsilla was found guilty was because he was poorly trained. The police's training is not proper. Well, you know, training always has a role in this. However, things to note is Forsilla in the last three and a half years drew his gun 12 times, which is a lot. And not all police officers do that. How many times do you draw your gun during your career? Uh, maybe twice. Once I can remember for sure. Twice maybe in how twice. many years? in almost 11 years. So that's, it, for Silos, is disproportionate, you believe? It, totally, mm -hmm. totally disproportionate. The other thing is, the other officers who were there, you know, they maybe drew their guns, but they didn't fire. Mm -hmm. Even 
in spite of the, the, the phenomenon where, you know, when a shot goes off, other people have a tendency to shoot also. That didn't happen here. Didn't happen. So what does that say about Fursillo? The other thing, too, is police are also trained to de-escalate. Mm -hmm. Okay? He did not de-escalate. Semi a team is in a streetcar, threat to nobody. Fursillo wasn't that close, but as close as he was, it's because he was advancing and he kept getting closer and closer. So he forced what he felt was going to be a confrontation. Mm -hmm. He could have backed off. He could have waited for time. He, you know, he didn't have to retreat. All he had to do was put some space. So, but he wasn't doing that. So I don't think that it's, it's just about training. I think it also has to do with Forsillo's personality. John, how many years were you a cop? Uh, 10 years. How many times did you draw your gun? Uh, uh, well, five years as in uh, PRU, and that would be what, what's that? Uh, the public um, primary response unit, and then five years in traffic. So if you want to compare apples to apples, in the first five years when I was in uh, primary response, I drew it twice. Twice in five years. Right. But to um, everyone else's point, I think the problem with the training is that it's a uh, one-size-fits-all. It doesn't take into account personalities. Hmm. So I think it actually, you have to step back and say, okay, who are we hiring? Right? Are, are we hiring the right people? And obviously, by and large, the police are doing a great job. But there are certain pat personalities that I think uh, the police departments need to stay away from. And then the last point I was quickly going to make was that it also comes down to supervision. To, to your point, uh, David, is that when you draw your gun 13 times in three and a half years, hmm. where's the oversight? You say, by and large, obviously the police are doing a great job. Do you feel that's a tougher case to sell to the public this week on a week when the Forsilla verdict came in and on a week when... You've got four other officers charged with obstruction of justice and lying, basically. It is, it is a tougher sell, but I think the problem started uh, long before with previous chiefs and with previous uh, association presidents. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll go back to Chief Fantino, who's a, a, an aggressive personality. Uh, I'll go back to Craig Brumell, who was an aggressive personality. He was the head of the police association. Police association and they've kind of gone d down that road. Now, um, uh, McCormick, he's actually, I, I'd say, quite articulate. The current association. Association president, head. yeah. So I, hopefully he can change that perception somewhat. But I think it started then. And I think even if you look at sort of things like the police budget, there's this feeling that the police are, they just do what they want to do. Here's the key KPMG report. Let's put it on the shelf, business as usual. So if they're not willing to modernize and get with the times with things as the police, such as the police budget, where's the faith that they will do it in other situations? Jennifer, I wonder if, let's pick up on this issue of tone. You know, the, the, the rhetoric has gotten increasingly hot over the last, mm -hmm. say, 10 or 15 years, both out of the chief's office and uh, out of the um, union leadership. Does that play a role in any of this? I believe it does. It sets the tone for service. And there's no question that leadership will vary by service, by person. And that's a very important thing to consider. You've got supervision and leadership that occurs at all levels. And as my colleague over here mentioned, this is not a, a, a situation whereby this officer pulled his weapon for the first time. Mm. And so where is that supervision? And where is the gap in training? I'm questioning whether it's a, a gap in the sense of not adjusting for perceptions that will vary by individual. Let me understand the supervision. You're saying at some point, because every time you draw your revolver, you're supposed to file a report. Correct. So at some point, you're, th you're saying somebody in management should have seen that this man was disproportionately taking his revolver out of its holster and should have intervened that should look at those cases very closely to see whether the evidence supported that level of use of force. Hmm. Do you know whether other police services do that kind of intervention? I have seen it occur at other services, yes, especially with officers under five years of service. Huh. David, you wanted to say? Priscilla was seen. He was flagged. He was flagged twice because of the number of times he has drawn his Flagged weapon. by whom? By, by the force. They have a, if you do it more than I think, uh, three times in a six-month period, I believe it is, um, you're flagged, okay? But nothing was done with that. He was flagged twice, and nothing was done with that. What would you have expected to be done? I would expect him to be taken off the street, and I would expect um, psychiatrists, him to be seen by a psychiatrist, and I would expect the incidents to be uh, investigated and, and, you know, find out is it a coincidence or is there, is there a problem here? 
And I, and I think that, so I think the police aren't doing enough. You know, here he's flagged and nothing is done with it. He's flagged. We know about it. And there's no action. If there's no action, then really nothing's being done. He's also, for Silla we're talking about here, he's also been described as really away from the job, quite a lovely guy, right? Had an ailing mother that he, that he took care of and, uh, you know, by all accounts, uh, like a decent guy. Yeah, and I don't know him, and I don't want to speculate on whether he's a good person or a bad person. I don't want to go necessarily down that road, but I think um, when we're in certain situations, we re react in certain ways, and uh, you can say that about everybody. Hmm. But to the point of tone, even if you look at City Hall, we see how the tone has changed with the new mayor. Yes. Leadership starts at the top, hmm. right? And uh, I have full confidence in Chief Saunders, he's just new, but he can change the tone. And his supervisors, star sergeants, staff sergeants, superintendents, you name it, they can change the tone. And that's where I think it has to start. John, let me pick up on something you, you talked about a few minutes ago, and that is who we recruit to be police officers right now. Don't take this the wrong way, but when, you know, when I first moved to Toronto, every cop in this town looked like you. Do you know what I mean? Like over six feet tall. Thanks. Yeah, no, I don't mean it as a, as a compliment yeah, yeah. or as an insult. Yeah. I'm just saying every cop in this town was over six feet tall, male, white, of a certain age. You know what I'm getting Absolutely. at here. Absolutely. Is that part of the problem here? Well, I think part of the problem, potentially, uh, but I think that's changed. I think we can't use a, you know, a broad brush here. It has changed in many ways. There are a lot of positive things that have gone on over time. Like you see the composition of the, the service changing, but you have to get people applying to the service, mm -hmm. uh, you know, women, minorities, you name it. And the police, like look, there are a lot of wonderful uh, outreach programs the police are doing in Flemington Park. We have a, they have, I started, helped them start it, a hockey league, a free hockey league for kids. Getting, getting the, the community early having a positive uh, interaction. We need to do more of that, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Jennifer, your view on that. I, re I absolutely agree. And I think that police community relations is something that needs to start right from the beginning and not when we sit here scratching our heads going, what has gone wrong? Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, is what exactly does that mean? What is a good relationship with the community. You look at, for instance, depictions in the media of certain cases, then you look at environmental scans that show a completely different picture in terms of perceptions of the police in that community. Hmm. So we always gotta be cognizant of the source of that information. But at the same time, we see a lot of programs within police services. For instance, Waterloo Regional Police has a cops and youth program that for 12 weeks has officers working with high school students to illuminate what it is an officer does. Hmm. To have them go back in the community as ambassadors. When you say working with them, they come to the schools? They come to headquarters. Oh, the students come to headquarters? After okay. school from 7 to 9.30. And they do that every week. Hmm. And they do a crime prevention project that they bring back to their school. Is it working? It looks to be, yes, from the numbers. And also in terms of the ambassadorship that we see with the young people that have been in that program. They're doing charity walks. They're participating in all types of community initiatives that bring awareness for other issues that are unique to that particular area. David, you've known hundreds and hundreds of cops over the years. Yeah. I'd like to know from your experience, what makes for a good cop? Well, can I just address what you were, what you were talking about sure. here? So it's one thing to play hockey with you know, the communities. It's another thing to play basketball with the communities and all of that. So all of that goodwill, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But then when the game is over, life begins. And you have other police officers who will come in and they act the same old way, and they undo any good that that has done. Hmm. So until you have police truly policing themselves, other police officers, those programs are gonna do very little good because they just undo it, everything that's hmm. been done. Okay, what makes for a good cop? What makes for a good cop is, I think, life experience. Um, having experience being um, on the bottom as well as on the top. Um, education, and, and I, I'm not saying just because a person has gone to college or university, you know, that that makes them a good cop, but there should be education as well. Mm -hmm. um, the, pers the personality, they have to have patience, they have to have perseverance, they have to have intelligence. Education doesn't always equate to e intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that person has to have um, 
the ability to challenge themselves, challenge their own perceptions, challenge their own reactions, challenge who they are. You know, I can remember a time when I was a police officer and there was uh, two young men who were kissing. They were on Bay Street. And we got out of our car and there were two police cars, four officers, and some of the officers were giving the kids a hassle and I was right in there too. And one of the kids looked at me and says, what have we done? And you know, that hit me like a bolt of lightning. Like, what am I becoming? What have I, what am I doing? They haven't harmed anybody. They haven't done anything. So you have to challenge yourself. You know, you have to look in the mirror and look at yourself and you have to have that ability. I'm not saying that I was super cop or the best or anything like that, but I just remember that incident as I was going down a path because of the subculture that I might not have gone down um, ordinarily. And so I, I have to be able to challenge myself as to what am I becoming, what are my beliefs. John, I want to follow up with you on that. And um, if you want to share a similar personal anecdote, please do. But I, you know there is a sense among a good chunk of the population in this capital city of Ontario that thinks that the cops are, that too many cops are too narrow-minded, uh, too tunnel-visioned about the population that they serve. Fair point? Uh, I don't think so. And I'll, a couple things I'll say. Uh, what people are doing to the police, which is stereotyping, is what many communities claim the police, and rightfully so in some search, uh, situations, are doing to them. So I think we need to step back from that. I think we need to look at this truly with impartial eyes and have an open mind. Uh, but I would take exception to one thing David said, which was about playing hockey or doing these programs. It's, it's also about educating the police. It's a, about having a positive interaction with the community, right? And, it, and understanding that we all want the same thing for our kids. We want them to have opportunity, go to school, have a good life. Like that we're, there are more similarities than there are differences. And that's why I'm a big believer in getting the police out into the community. If I could, and if I were chief, I'd like to see a process whereby if you want to get promoted, you need to do community work, work with the community. Not in Newmarket, not in Whitby, in Toronto. Get to know your community. And I, I just can't uh, emphasize that enough. Do you worry, Jennifer, that the events of the past week, namely the verdict and these additional charges that have come out against these other four officers, uh, that it's eroding the public's faith in its police service? Absolutely. because. As we've been talking about, we're using this one big paintbrush and saying all officers are like this, and that's so far from the case. I can give you an example. I was in a patrol car because a lot of my research involves working with patrol on their full shifts and going to all the calls for service. And we ran into a situation whereby it was really being questioned by a citizen, why should I listen to you? Why should I trust you? And the officer said something very, very profound, at least to me. He says, because I'm not what you see on TV. Huh. So we, we take a lot of our cues about what we think about the police from law 90, and order and S 90 special victims of our, unit and all that. 90% of our information on crime comes from the media. It's disproportionate. Violent crime is approximately 7% on average at any given time, and it constitutes over 50% of the coverage on the media. So we're sending a certain image, and we need to have an open dialogue. If we want police community relations to improve, there has to be a dialogue between the citizens and the police. There has to be education that goes both ways. Hmm. Officers have to understand the perceptions and needs of the citizens and the community that they're working with, and citizens need to have a better understanding of what it is the police do. I want to, again, tap into your experience as an ex-cop here. So you, you know the culture, you know the people. Mike McCormick, the head of the police mm -hmm. union, said this week that the Yatim verdict is going to put a chilling effect on police officers in the city. They're going to be afraid to do their job. They maybe will not draw their revolvers when they ought to. They are, they, this verdict puts them in more danger than is necessary. Do you agree with that? I don't. I don't because uh, two reasons. One, as Jennifer pointed out, there were really two situations that went on. There were the first three shots and then the next six. Mm -hmm. So I believe that what the, ver uh, the jury said was, hey, when you're in a situation where someone has a knife, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But when they're on their back, 
after you've shot them three times and there are seven or eight officers standing around, not so much. Hmm. So I, I think that's the, uh, that's the key point. The one other point I'd like to make, when I was on the service, this was going back in the 90s, Bob Ray, who was the Premier at the time, introduced uh, the necessity to file a report when you pulled your, your gun. And we all said, oh, this is the worst thing that could ever happen, hmm. and police are going to fear, they, they won't want to pull their gun for fear of consequences. Right. That hasn't been borne out. We've got a quarter century of evidence now to look at on that front. Right. Hasn't happened? It hasn't happened. And in fact, if, um, and I wasn't a supporter of Bob Ray, so let me just start with you, that. You but don't say. <laughs> no. I actually quite uh, admire him now. But, um, but the point is, it was all about education. It was all about exactly what we're talking about now, the Frasillo situation, avoiding it. And I think if management had have done their job, then I think we, we may have seen a different situ uh, outcome. Sheldon, we got this clip standing by? Great. Uh, this is a very short clip, but I want to share it with everybody here and then just get your reaction to it. This goes back to last December, not that long ago. A man with a machete threatening people, and he actually attacked one person with it. Here's the video of how a security guard named Nathaniel McNeil responded to that situation. Roll it, please. Okay, um, David, thoughts on how that was handled? Well, it's admirable, but I, I'm not going to say that because he did that, that's how police officers should react. There's no way, you know, there's just no way. Police officers aren't expected to put their lives in danger, you know. Um, you know, this, it's good that this turned out that way, but it, I don't think it can be an expectation. Yeah, turned out okay, but that could have gone absolutely, south really absolutely. You know, that's a a big knife. <laughs> yeah, that was a big knife. You know, um, no, absolutely. You have to take it um, situation by situation. You can't say any time with a knife, that's what you do. The other thing, he had the advantage of coming from behind that young man, um, hmm. so the young man didn't see him coming. Hmm. You know, police officers don't usually have that advantage. So if someone's facing you with a knife, you're going to pull your gun, and I, I, and they should. There's no question about that. However, you can still de-escalate or try to de-escalate. You're speaking to him. You know, they talk about this in the recommendations and, you know, speaking to him and trying to address him and having some, uh, some distance between you and him, if you can, you know, if there's not other people that are closer who might be in danger or something, so. What'd you think of the way the person handled that? Admirable, absolutely daring, admirable. Though, yes? um, if that person was very versed in using a knife, that would not have ended that well. Mm. The other thing is, is that even if an officer pulls their weapon, there's a big difference between pulling the weapon and discharging it, and there's tactical communication that occurs, which the security guard would not have been trained in. Mm. And so you approach every single situation and you assess it based on its own merits. Mm. So you can't, again, take a paintbrush and say all cases with an individual who has a knife should be dealt with in this way. Right. Did you ever have a situation like that? Uh, we di I did have a situation where someone had a knife about that size, but there were about 10 other officers there. So not exactly like that. But my description of that would be reckless. And to David's point, and thank, thank goodness it, it uh, turned out in a positive way, but to David's point, police officers are paid whatever they're paid, $90,000 a year, to risk their lives. They're not paid to die. No, for right? sure, but we don't want them recklessly risking their lives. Absolutely. Well, to that point then, uh, Steve, if you look, you know, we have this tragic situation uh, in involving uh, Constable Fursillo. How many situations have there been in the last year, exactly. five years, 20 years, where police have disarmed people and no harm has come? And it's, it's a tendency to, to focus on the one bad issue or situation, which is absolutely fine if we're using it to improve the situation, but not just to beat up on the police, because 99.9% .9 of the time, they do a heck of a job. i got 20 seconds left here, Jennifer. Let me give it to you just to say, you know, this so often feels like deja vu all over again, as Yogi Berra used to say. Are we ever going to make enough progress on this so that we're not, you know, refighting the same old battles over and over? Progress in, and we've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> in, in, you know, let's go full circle. The Forcilla situation in handling mental illness on the street and dealing with dangerous people, this kind of thing. I find that the agencies work in silos. 
And I think that the community is in a silo, the police are in a silo, mental health resources are in a silo, and we need to cooperate. We need to collaborate between agencies to better respond to the needs of marginalized and vulnerable populations. Gotcha. Thanks, everybody, for coming in today, helping us out with this. Jennifer Schulenberg from the University of Waterloo. Thanks for making the drive. I know it was probably not a heck of a lot of fun. David Mercury, the former Toronto police officer. John Burnside, Toronto City Councillor, Ward 26. Appreciate it, everybody. You're welcome. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.